You're going on that trip to France? Mm -hmm. That's the gap. So you went to Africa. Yeah. Good evening. This is a meeting of the Scarborough Board of Education. It's Thursday, November 30th, 2017. May I have the roll call, please? Mrs. Bealey? Here. Mrs. Durgan? Here. Ms. Casalona? Here. Mrs. Lyford? Here. Ms. Perry? Here. Mrs. Shea? Here. Ms. Starr? Here. Mr. Hitson? Here. And Mr. Vashon? Here. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any adjustments to the agenda? Um, there are three additions to the appointment list when we get to that. That's it? Yep. Okay. 5.0. Oh, are there any public comments at this time? If you wish to make a comment to the board on any item on the agenda, please come forward and state your name. Seeing none, we'll move on to 6.0, oh, Superintendent's Report. I have a couple of some things to update you on today. Uh, the first one is that uh, this meeting is in, in lieu of our December 7th meeting because there's some um, refinement work that's being done to the chambers. So I will share our enrollment report with you. Um, it's also, it will also be displayed up on the screen here. Um, this month our enrollment has gone up by seven students. So we have 2,925 students in the Scarborough Public Schools um, with the high school at 957. The middle school saw an increase of four students um, in their overall enrollment numbers to 720. Two more students at Wentworth at 678. Two new students at Blue Point, 178, and then at Eight Corners. Um, one less student at 222 and Pleasant Hill remains the same at 170. So again, we continue to monitor enrollment each month and we like to share that publicly. Of course, um, there could be more or more students that are moving in and out. With these are just looking at the aggregate numbers. It doesn't necessarily mean that seven new students came. There could have been more or less depending on how the numbers worked out. Um, we also have coming up um, the community viewing of the mask we live in, or the mask you live in rather. That's going to be on January 24th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, and we've been doing several community viewings of different really powerful films. We did this film last year as well, which is really about um, healthy masculinity. And I think just given what's happening in our um, culture right now in our society, it's a really, th this work is more relevant than ever. Um, we also just trained 40 more students, high school students, right before Thanksgiving break. And our goal this year is to have 120 high school students go through the Reducing Sexism and Violence program while also um, continuing to work with all of the eighth grade boys. 
And then all of the eighth grade girls work with Hardy Girls Healthy Women. So really just trying to address these issues um, that are so relevant and that are impacting our students every day um, and then, you know, bringing more attention to it with the recent things that are happening in the news. So we would like to have a lot of community involvement in that and then there will be a panel discussion afterwards that will be led by um, students who have gone through the training. So it's a really great community event on January 24th at the high school in the auditorium. Um, also, the Hour of Code is getting started. It's kind of silly that it's called Hour of Code because it really goes all week. Um, but students and staff at Eight Corners <laughs> kicked off their Hour slash Week of Code today at an assembly where they were introduced um, to what computer science is. Next will be Blue Point and Pleasant Hill schools. Um, and then I know Wentworth is planning to do the same thing but waiting until the March time frame to do it. So I think the national hour of code is usually during the first week of December. So we're you know kind of right around that. Um, and someone we know really well was there talking with students about perseverance in the design process, Kelly Murphy illustrated this through the story of how the new Wentworth School went from being a dream to becoming a reality by using the design process. So she's still busy. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw her this morning at a health safety and advisory team <laughs> committee meeting. So um, thank you, Kelly, for your continued service. Um, we also have some really exciting work going on with our K-12 Comprehensive Prevention Planning Committee. Um, so this is a committee that consists of myself, Chief Moulton, our Director of Athletics and Activities, Mike Legage, Molly Montgomery, who is our um, Student Support Service Provider at the high school, who if you remember, in this budget cycle we increased her from a half-time employee to a .8 employee, um, specifically so that we could focus more on prevention measures around substance use and adolescent um, and just really overall wellness, but adolescent brain development has been what we've been talking a lot about. And uh, David Courier, our middle school principal, is also a member of that group, and David Creech will be joining us as we um, get ready to, we're really working <coughs> hard on planning our first big event, which will be in March. Um, we think it's going to be on March 12th with a snow date of March 29th, um, and the topic is raising healthy teens. Um, but it's really for everyone in the community. So um, our marketing material will sound like if you were a teen, know a teen, interact with a teen, are going to have a teen, like you want to come to this event. Um, and it's planned to be from 6 to 8. The first hour will happen in the auditorium where we're going to be um, inviting four expert panelists to talk about um, relevant issues uh, about raising healthy um, people in general, but specifically adolescents. So we know that um, we have a, a soft commitment from Liz Blackwell-Moore, who will be coming to talk about adolescent brain development and substance use. The other topic will be a, around sleep, um, and we're looking, we have a, a strong partner who we're just waiting for a commitment on that. We're also looking at stress management and technology use. So they'll each do like a brief presentation, five to ten minutes, and then there will be a time for questions and answers. And then afterwards, in the um, high school cafeteria, we'll have a wellness social, we're calling it, um, right now. Um, but the idea is that we're inviting a lot of community partners and vendors from the area, both on the prevention and the treatment side of wellness. Um, so we uh, will have people who um, work in Scarborough or around Scarborough, such as um, Project Grace will be there. We're going to reach out to like the Oasis Wellness Center and some of the local fitness centers in the area and yoga studios. We will also have, um, we hope to have some folks from the Maine Medical Center, um, Martin's Point, um, and the list is really long of all the vendors that we're planning to contact with. We were just waiting to set the date, which I think we did today, um, but that, it's going to be a really great event. So mark that on your calendars, March 12th, no date, March 29th. Um, we're really excited about that. And it's really a great way for us to look at all the work in our district um, that we do from as early as kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade with supporting the whole child in overall wellness. Um, the other thing I would just report out on is the Thanksgiving Day that we had at Wentworth. It was a great event, another really big success. Um, many of you were there. I think, um, were you going to talk about that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Well. 
I just wanted to thank the community for all, all of those who were involved. Peter Esposito, our Director of Food Service, Kelly Murphy, Project Grace, um, Jackie was there the, the whole time too. And I think that we served like 250 people and then had um, like 30 meals that went out the door that other folks were taking to people who weren't able to come physically to the Wentworth cafeteria. So thank you, Joanne, for your work in that as well. Another successful event. And so I'm sure there will be another one next year. Report for tonight. Oh, no. Excuse me. Could I ask, uh, I know it's a little out of order, but we have two gentlemen here who are at the high school. What did they think of this last year? Sure. Okay. Should either of you attend? Well, Dylan just went through the training. Oh, yeah. The two full day training. Boys to men? Yep. So, yeah, I just went through this last week. It was quite intense, but at the same time it was very beneficial. I was extremely surprised to see how many students there were that were totally supportive of the idea and very open-minded. Um, I had been through a couple of these trainings before and I think that comparing it to others, this was probably one of the best I've been to. They covered everything that seemed necessary to be covered and a lot of the students who participated are quite excited to start working on other projects, working with Boys to Men, and hopefully leading the next few trainings later this year. Thomas, did you see any difference in attitudes at the high school after this last year? Um, I would say that in terms of attitudes, I feel like people were, you know, more aware. That there was just a general awareness that people otherwise wouldn't have. Uh, they, they considered many of the ideas that were brought up, I think, in the uh, the movie. And I think that just helps to raise awareness to have conversation about this, to be informed about this where people otherwise wouldn't be. So I personally haven't seen it. Um, hard to, uh, hard to with my uh, very packed schedule, but I've heard what other people said about it. So um, I, I have a pretty good idea of the message that is being communicated. Thank you. Dylan, when Thank you went to the training, was it, are there any girls invited to that? or is yep. it strictly? Oh, okay. It's actually, they do 20 boys and 20 girls. 20 students who identify female and 20, 20 yeah. who identify female. 20 okay. identified. And I believe in this training specifically, we did have quite the diversity. And I know they were excited to see that there weren't necessarily all people who identify with a specific gender. We had a few gender nonconforming and some transgender, which they were excited to see participate. And I think that in the long run, one of the biggest takeaways was that gender identity is not just a binary. Um, they did spend a lot of time talking about how it is more of a spectrum and that students don't need to be, don't need to choose necessarily and they broke down stereotype walls and just tried to make it seem much more open. Towards the end, you would you notice a big difference in um, comfort levels, I guess. You, a lot of people were much more willing to share all their opinions towards the end because of how well they handled all these scenarios and gave examples of stuff. And it's two full six-hour days. Oh. Um, so they do it. He they actually did it here last year. It was at um, St. Max, and this year they were here in this in the chamber um, for two full days. Wow, back to back. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. No wonder it was intense. It was. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Uh, 7.0, the chairs report. Just a couple of things. Just wanted to congratulate our football team. So winning the Class A championship, it's been how long, Jackie? 1993 oh or 83 since the last time? No, no, no. We, we didn't start. Like We've only had football, what, 15 years? 93. Yeah. It's the first time yeah, I think for Scarborough a as a Class A. Yeah. Class A. Right. You won right. Class B, yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, pretty exciting stuff, and I want to remind everyone that um, the holidays are coming. We're going to be a break between Christmas and return to school. Those backpacks need to be filled 
uh, for kids that uh, will be bringing food home. So anyone who has any packaged goods, you can always drop them off just at uh, Wentworth School or take them right at the window there. So that's pretty important. Um, finally, I wanted to share with you, uh, maybe some of you have al already read this yesterday, if you read the uh, local Portland Press Herald. But <clears throat> this was, I thought, an excellent article uh, regarding state funding to schools. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you didn't get a chance to read it, there it is. Please share it at home with your family. <laughs> Um, pretty significant information right across the state, and of course we're smack right in the middle so. <laughs> of uh, the impact of that loss of funding. Well, and I think that one key point in this is that although it's a trend across the state that more and more of the burden of public education is falling on the local taxpayer, the way that the formula works, um, it is based, it is designed to be something that's based on equity. So the more um, the more your community thrives and the more success your community has, the less funding that's coming your way mm -hmm. in some aspects. Right. So um, yeah. it, for Scarborough, it's amplified. Right. Um, also, I wanted to mention to you that uh, we'd like to have mentors step forward for our two new school board members. So if you think that you might be willing to kind of be a resource to either one of our members and you would just touch base every two weeks or something like that and say how it's going and answer some questions and so I would just suggest that you go ahead and let them know yourself who it is rather than go through me on it and, and do it that way. That would be great. And that's the end of my report. 8.0 is committee reports. Jackie? We continue to uh, negotiate. We've had an inquiry from the uh, administrator's organization to start negotiations on their contract. Uh, we've not had any uh, feedback a couple of months now on the bus driver's contract, so neither we have nor has our, our lawyer. So we're just, everything's on hold. Okay, um, Carrie? Um, the communication committee at our last meeting had a nice um, discussion. We were joined by um, our webmaster, Sean Bushway, and our technology guru, Jen Day, who we share with the town. And we talked a little bit about um, what a school app might possibly look like. It's nothing, you know, firm, but we, we discussed a little bit about um, what we would like to see, what we feel like are highlights, and um, also, I guess in the next year or so, they're going to need to be redesigning the website because of a change in our Google platform, and so we talked about that as well. Um, and our next meeting is this next Monday, uh, the 4th. Uh, should I talk about information at the IBC at all? Mm -hmm. uh, sure. Uh, Leanne is also on the impl Implementation Planning Committee for Start Time, the School Start Time Committee that is also with parents and uh, leadership. And um, at our last meeting, we talked about how um, progress is being made on designing the school bus routes for next year with this change in start times. And um, so we're kind of firming up what the order of the bus stops will be, and we're going to have more information about that coming out very soon. Uh, so we're hoping to be able to be putting out information so that families can be planning ahead and thinking ahead uh, for next year and thinking about what kind of childcare they might need and that sort of thing. So um, everyone should just watch for information on that soon. And I would say I did just post on Facebook again today what the school schedule will look like and when the doors will open because folks are still wondering if the change is happening, um, if the decision has already been made. So yes, the decision was made last April. It is going to happen. Um, so we want everyone to really start preparing and planning. Jody. So the Joint Finance Committee met on November 21st, right before Thanksgiving. Um, and had a really great discussion. I felt like it was a productive meeting. And one of the takeaways that I think could be beneficial for all of us as, as chairs of different committees was talking about really expanding um, and making sure that everyone here at the board 
understands what's going on at those meetings because sometimes I sort of just go through the highlights and um, <coughs> if you have questions or need clarity on things that are said through this discussion, speak up because it's important for you to feel like you know what's happening along the way. Um, and I guess especially with finance because it sort of becomes a very big topic um, quickly. So our next meeting as a joint um, finance committee will be December 19th from 6 to 7.30, I believe. Hopefully we've got room. I think I've heard we have room um, confirmation, so that's good. And we will be um, inviting the communications committees from both the board and the town council. So if you're on the communications committee for us, which is pretty much just Hillary because Carrie and I are also on finance, so it's an easy combination. Um, we just felt like a lot of our conversations over the past year have been about communicating the budget. And so we felt like bringing in the communications committee helps take that off the finance um, plate so we can focus on and really dig deep into specifics of different aspects of the budget, both municipal and school at those joint meetings. So bringing in the communications committee to sort of take that on and that will help us with that. We also talked about the budget forum and how um, it's a lot of work. It's very labor intensive for staff, both on the town side and the school side. And we just aren't sure that it's the most effective use of our time. And frankly, we're not sure that the questions that we're digging into are actually the questions of the majority of the, the community. We feel like giving people an opportunity at a higher level to sort of understand like how does it work, how is this process working and how, how do you move through it and why are you investing here or why are you investing there are the more general questions that people may have rather than um, there were some very technical and very specific questions um, in the last budget forum. So just trying to figure out new ways to do that and it may be um, smaller um, we ca keep calling it a road show. I don't know that that's the best um, name for it, but going to where people are rather than asking them to always come to us um, and finding different places and maybe different times to, to meet with people. And I think Peter Hayes, Peter Hayes and I are, are going to start developing that, but Peter has reached out to um, the police chief and the fire chief because they kind of did a traveling road show for the new public safety building and find out where they went and, and the reception they had and, and what places make the most sense and then divvying that up amongst the um, 14, the 14 people that we have at that committee? It must be because we were thinking seven well, we were, I think seven we were thinking stops. seven board members and seven counselors. Right. That's, I think, where the 14 came from. Okay, so se there'll be seven little stops around town. Um, at least that's the plan at this point. And then, um, and it will be very similar, m more casual than the budget forum. It will, it will potentially mirror, you know, a conversation, a discussion where people feel more comfortable asking their questions or bringing up ideas rather than having them come and, and stand at a podium. Um, just, we're just trying to figure out ways to engage a larger group of citizens and, and answer their questions rather than um, sort of thinking we know what their questions are, let's let them come and, and ask. And we have started the budget calendar, which I don't have a copy of um, last year's, but we'll all get one here too, and it will list on there both the joint finance committees, um, the school board committee um, meetings, the budget forums that we plan, anything and everything that we have the first reading second reading, public hearing. So it will list out all of those meetings that um, we ultimately all attend come spring. Okay, thank you. Mary? Before, before, while we're in finance, I forgot to update you about oh. something in my one of my reports. Okay. Um, 
we did submit two applications for a regional service center for the regional service center application. The deadline was today, November 30th, and um, many districts decided to do it um, sort of in the final hour of the submission. And um, some of the big reasons for us doing that is that doing the part one application doesn't commit us um, to forming a regional service center at this point, but it does um, allow the state to calculate the incentives that would be earned if you do participate, which will be really important as we go into this budget cycle. We'll be able to see how um, being a part of a regional service center might generate additional funding for our district, um, and then we'll be able to better assess to what extent is that going to be a good return on our investment in terms of the time and the effort that it takes to be a part of a regional service center. Um, and so this is something that came through the main Department of Education and was established by the legislator um, during this last biennium. And the, it, the goal is to incentivize districts to share services <coughs> and look for efficiencies. And as you know, we already do this. Um, we share a food service director with Kate Elizabeth. Um, we also share um, professional development and recruitment efforts and things like that with members from the Sebago Education Alliance. So we did two separate applications, one with the Sebago Educational Alliance 2.0 because South Pointland is also joining us and that currently involves Bonnie Eagle, which is MS86, um, Wyndham Raymond, Scarborough, and Gorham. And then South Portland is joining us for this regional center application. Um, we think it could have, the incentives could total up to be a couple hundred thousand dollars um, depending on enrollment numbers and things like that. So. Uh, we felt that it was very much worth our time and effort to at least apply for the first part. Um, and then with Cape Elizabeth, so the three areas that we're looking at with the Sebago Alliance 2.0 is um, food service co-op, so shared purchasing of food service um, supplies and food. And the other area is development of a regional leadership academy, which we had already been working on um, and putting a lot of time and effort into because we're also applying for a FEDIS grant in this month um, to try to generate some additional funding. And um, the third area is professional development and recruitment. So some of those things are, they were all things that were sort of in the works of being refined, but we formalized it by applying. And then with Cape Elizabeth, we're the Scarborough Cape Alliance. Um, and we're looking at two areas, um, food service administration, uh, which we currently do, and um, co collaborative purchasing of custodial supplies and materials. So seeing if we can find some efficiencies there. Again, it's low commitment in the first round. Um, the reason why some superintendents were apprehensive to apply was because there's still a lot of information we don't have about the rules of the regional service centers. Um, but it's really low stakes at this point for us to be a part of that. And then there's a part two application that'll take place in April. So we'll have more information to know if we want to continue down this path of the regional service centers. But I think I couldn't emphasize enough that these we're always looking for efficiencies in this way. So um, it's just really re reinforcing and solidifying some of the good work that's already happening. So. so this idea of a regional service center, is that a concept that is just in our minds? It won't be a location. It'll just be a joint effort to buy things or? Well, so with the Sebago Alliance 2.0, um, Superintendent Lancia from Westbrook is the fiscal agent, um, and so he's the executive director, if you will, and we have a whole governance structure um, that also was a part of the application that we had to submit. And then with the Cape Scarborough Alliance, I am the, the executive director, if you will. Um, and what that means is that we'll, like separately but together have oversight of those two regional service centers. You don't have to have a physical space. Mm -hmm. um, it could be, you know, we could look at other ways to um, share services, whether it's, I know some districts are looking at sharing transportation services. Mm -hmm. Others are thinking, is there a way for us to share um, some like business administrative functions and things like that. So we wanted to start small with things that we know we can do and execute really well um, and that we anticipate will bring a return um, or cost savings to our district because the goal is ultimately that any money, any savings that is generated, it goes directly back into the classroom. So that's what we're trying to accomplish by 
sharing some of these services where it makes sense. In some mm -hmm. cases, it would actually end up costing us more mm -hmm. if we tried to regionalize. So, mm -hmm. again, starting small um, so that we can be thoughtful as we move forward. Does that answer it? It does. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any questions about that? Okay, I'm just going to report out on the school and business partnership meeting. Our committee met on November 9th. And at that meeting, they discussed the steps to be used by the school department and the businesses to get on board with a um, creating this connection between the businesses and the schools. Mrs. Sizemore has volunteered to be the initial contact for the businesses. Um, Siemens um, presented the kinds of work that, that they have been doing in schools uh, prior to coming to our meeting. Uh, regarding energy and STEM-related activities that they go around to schools all over the New England, it sounded like, mm -hmm. to talk about energy. And um, then they did talk about numerous possibilities for uh, interacting with the businesses in the town of Scarborough and elsewhere once we get up and running. And also they discussed a, about a job fair that is going to be at South Portland High School, I believe, mm -hmm. this year sometime, and that Scarborough uh, would, be would be invited to that. They didn't say exactly what grade levels that would be, but that's an update on the school and business partnership. As far as policy goes, um, well, we'll be talking to you in just a couple of minutes about mm -hmm. the latest mm -hmm. policies that we're bringing forth in policy. Yes? Uh, when we talk about the business uh, alliance, the membership has consistently been white collar workers in town. Am I correct? Mm, no. Mm -mm. No. no. Mm. We're re really what what we have right now, Jackie, is sign a core group that is getting kind of like the logistics worked out. But the goal is that any any business in and around Scarborough can become a partner, um, and we're looking at developing a wide range of partnerships so that we can best, you know, connect students with different types of experiences. That, that's the point that I wanted to make, yeah. that we have a number of businesses that, that it would employ uh, mechanics and mm -hmm. uh, especially uh, plumbers and heat and all of that business. And I just think that, that we need to... to we need to educate our students that, yes, they may wish to go to college, but if they want to make some money, they may want to be a plumber. <laughs> <laughs> True. Good point. Good point, Jackie. Well, you, you know, here's a little quip that I saw that I read. A woman went to college. She went and got her master's degree. She was in some kind of social services or teaching or whatever, and she had an enormous debt. And she read in the paper that that there was an apprenticeship for a heating technician. And there was training provided, and she went. And she took a six-week training on how to fix furnaces and things of that. Paid off her debt in three years. Wow. I mean, well, I have a master's degree. Fortunately, <laughs> I didn't go out of state, so I was able to pay that off. But... I can't imagine what some of these young folks are facing. So we and we do need more plumbers. <laughs> so our visitors tonight, you just got some useful <laughs> towards graduation. You're always going to have a plumbing issue, guys. <laughs> uh -huh. oh. Okay. So with that, we'll move on to our student reports 9.0. Tom, do you have anything to share? Uh, yeah, I'll make it through this report, and then uh, I have a pretty bad headache, so um, I'll head out after that. Okay, thanks. Um, so in terms of student report, wow, it's been a while since I've done one of these. <laughs> um, but the first thing that I'd like to report about is, um, of course, the uh, Scarborough High, High School football team. I mm -hmm. just want to congratulate them in terms of 
th- th- I felt like there was a great uh, sense of spirit in the school after the win, uh, not not just winning it, but in the uh, manner that it was done, I felt was a great source of pride um, in the school, um, especially <coughs> the uh, first day back. Um, also, in terms of other things, um, last, ti- uh, last time I did these reports, uh, uh, I was still in Singing in the Rain, so mm-hmm. Singing in the Rain um, went well. That uh, great show, um, great turnout. Um, the, uh, the last performance, we had a great uh, crowd, great performance. Um, uh, th- uh, thanks to everyone who uh, went and saw that show. Um, uh, uh, One X has just started up. We had auditions this Monday, uh, and about 30 people, I think, auditioned around there. And I can say, um, having seen them, that th- there's a lot of great talent in Scarborough um, acting-wise. One, uh, one act play. Everyone did uh, a wonderful job. Um, <clears throat> in terms of NIASC visits, I feel like everyone uh, was very appropriate when um, n- the NIASC group was visiting. Um, everyone was very respectful. Uh, a lot of people volunteered to help. Um, gr- uh, they did a great job then. Um, and the high school band concert will be on the 6th. I've listened to a little bit of uh, what was being practiced, and I've got to say that I, I'm pretty excited for it. And then there will be a uh, holiday concert with the chorus and the band uh, soon after that. So that's what I have to report. Dylan has an entire presentation. It's quite extraordinary. I need to interject. Thomas has written one of the one-act plays. Oh, okay. <laughs> Wow. And the title is? Uh, it's uh, called Breaking the Barrier. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll just say that it's basically about a show that goes wrong, and the barrier is like breaking the fourth wall. Um, so <laughs> I right. strongly recommend you uh, watch it. It will be in March. <laughs> It'll be in March. <laughs> okay. Thank Dylan? You, so I have one thing to report out for the high school before I get into some other things, but I was actually so excited I got pictures for it. Um, So the high school, this has been going on for a few months now, but we finally uh, have our aquaponic system up and running. So this is in the Learning Commons in the high school for any of you who visited during the NIASC visit. This was just an empty fish tank. Um, But just a quick summary on what an aquaponic system is. It's a, this one is an 80 gallon fish tank that um, we have, when it's completed, we'll have 10 fish in it. And the byproduct of the fish can be broken down by bacteria into nutrients for plants that are growing right above it. And so there's a uh, plant bed above the fish tank that has, uh, it's covered in porous rocks so the water and nutrients can seep through. And right now we're growing kale, lettuce, and cilantro. And so it's still a work in progress right now, but the cool thing about this is that once it's finally up and running and we're kind of setting, settling down with all of the extra, like testing the water, we'll, uh, the food will be harvested and used in the TCK program with the academic and functional life skills groups. Which is the teen's cooking kitchen. Yeah, and so this was made possible by Mr. McCormick, who's a environmental science teacher, and a grant from the SES, which I found was quite cool. And that's all I have for the aquaponic system. But is there any questions on that? This was so interesting. You talked about this yeah. when you were at the NIESC visit, and I was like, "What is this big thing?" And you gave me the whole spiel on it, and it's. Fascinating. I think this is so cool. Are those Very plants cool. in water? Those are fish? plants on rocks. They're like on rocks. So and if the you fish take are underneath. Fish. Oh, underneath. There, so if you look in the photo, there's the oh, fish oh. tank underneath, and then right above oh, it, right. this garden bed is oh. sitting. And then I have a picture of one of the fish right there. 
And in, no, um, in Albert McCormick's, McCormick's classroom, there's a smaller aquaponics tank, and they're growing, um, what are they called, like beefsteak tomatoes? Mm -hmm. And they're like this big. It's really tall. It's really cool. Yeah. Right now, the, so this was over the last three months, this has been put together by students, actually. So he built the frame for this, but students filled it with water. They've connected all the piping. They've tested the water every single day for the last two months. They've fed the fish. They've planted all of the plants. Once it's fu com completely finished, the only thing that they'll continue to do is start new plants and then put them in. The rest of it will be taken over by the TCK. So I thought that was pretty cool. And this will be there till the end of time at this point. That's what our goal So. <laughs> If you ever get a chance, go check it out. Um, so since the last time I did my student report, I could, Thomas always told me I should just read the weekly reports because that's where I'd get most of my information, but I kind of got bored with that. So <laughs> it just didn't, I, I felt like I wasn't getting the best experience. So what I talked to, to I talked to Mr. Creech and he let me uh, start leaving school during my study halls to visit schools and experience it for myself. <laughs> and so I actually did this on the perfect time because the primary schools had a lot of visitors. So I brought photos from all of this too. So the Plymouth Plantation, uh, they had a few pilgrims come in and the students at the time were studying pilgrims and Wampanoags. And so they, before the visitors came, they wrote questions down and as they came in, and they'd ask the questions, they'd teach them how to bow and how to live like a pilgrim. It was quite fascinating. They had a lot of fun bowing. <laughs> I thought that was cool. And then this was also, they had a Wampanoag visit from a member of the Wampanoag tribe. He came in and shared lots of different materials and instruments they used. Um, <coughs> and the students were able to ask questions just like the other visit. And these were actually happening simultaneously. So when one finished, the other would move over. And each day of that week, a different school would have the visit, uh, which I thought was really cool. Um, because they, students studied this, these two topics in almost every class they had. They read about them in books, in their library class. They were learning about it in English. They even used turkeys with math. It was, I just thought that was so cool. Cross-curricular. Yeah. And then on Veterans Day, the Blue Point School had a Veterans Day celebration. Um, they, there were a few students' parents who, are, who served in the military or are currently serving that came and hung the flag, raised the flag, I should say, and they sang some songs for them. There was a big celebration where they had some food and got to learn more about what the military was like. And that was pretty cool, too. I thought that was nice. I went to Blue Point, so it was nice to go and visit again. And it was quite funny, actually. When I went through all of these schools, it was like the book fair was following me. Uh, so I was at the primary school for the first like week and a half, and it like kept moving. <laughs> but I did find, what I found was cool is each school received a donation of posters and books from Scholastic. And in the primary schools, because it was such a big donation, every student got something. Oh, okay. And they still had it made, they made it look like a raffle and like they did have the whole contest thing that does move through all the other schools. But I just found that really cool. Then the middle school hit and not as many people participated, but they did have a raffle. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so yeah, so I went through all my primary schools. I haven't got a chance to go to Wentworth yet, but the middle school was also quite interesting. I'm hoping through these visits that I'll learn more about how s these schools do like function like in the classroom too, because I think that there's another side of these reports that could be given on how these students are learning and like more kind of educating you all on how the like what these new technology integrations are and how students have changed since I was back in school. Forever ago. An old thing you I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> About to retire. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm excited to do these visits, but I thought I'd share some photos. I'm hoping I can have more throughout these reports. Fantastic. Yeah. Dylan, 
is this, is the high school going to have the soup bowls? I'm not sure. I haven't heard anything about that, but I can find out for you. Well, I've had a friend ask who went, she said, I haven't heard anything. And I said, well, I'd ask at the school board meeting. I haven't heard anything either. It's usually posted. Yeah. I'm not people sure. who don't know, we have students at the high school who make soup bowls, and the public can come in and get soup for lunch, and, you know, they buy the bowl. So that's been going on, what, two or Two or three years anyway. Oh, much longer than that. Much longer than that, yeah. yeah. And, um, Superintendent, do you want to talk about Reef Across America? Yes, I think. Um, Sorry, I'm like forgetting all these things. There's so much going on. Um, on December 11th, we have uh, we have the opportunity and honor to host a Reefs Across America stop, and so that will be Monday, December 11th at Scarborough High School. And we have a really, um, really nice respectful uh, program scheduled and David Creech, the principal at the high school, has been the lead coordinator on all of this. So um, it's a lot of work to organize the logistics of many semis and buses of people, but there will be hundreds and hundreds of people at the event and we are currently working collaboratively with the police department to collect the names of um, <coughs> Uh, veterans who live in Scarborough or families who um, have a veteran in their family or a fallen um, public servant. So we're, if anyone, um, if you know anyone and they haven't registered yet, we, we would like to honor our Scarborough residents who are, who have served um, or who are currently serving. And so that link is still available on um, our website. Also, if you went to the police department's website or checked our Facebook pages, you could find it there as well. Tom Griffin. We'll have a list. Mm -hmm. uh, I think John Thurlow has worked with him on that list when we've done uh, the Operation Cupid. Yep, we have we have that list. Um, and what we're asking is if you're if you are planning to come um, and or if you want to be recognized or not. So some people want to be recognized but they can't come, or they want to come but they don't want to be recognized. So um, we're trying to honor. And the mantra for Reese Across America is remember, honor, teach. And so we think that we've designed a program that really supports their mis their mission and what they're about. So it's. Scarborough is, we're thrilled and excited and honored to be able to host. So it's going to be a great community event. It's, um, we ask that all guests arrive at 735. The convoy is scheduled to arrive at like 745, 750. And then the program is just one hour from 8 to 9. And then um, there will be an opportunity for all who attend to be outside to send the convoy off. And so I haven't seen it before, but I heard it's quite an amazing sight to see. So. We're excited for that, and we plan to honor some um, of our veterans. So this is the 50th year since, of the, since the Vietnam War, and so we're looking at potentially honoring some Vietnam veterans at the ceremony, and we'll be able to present them with their own wreaths as well. So it's going to be a great program. Sounds like better watch out for traffic that morning, huh? <laughs> okay, very good. Thank you. And 10.0, recognition? We do have a couple of recognitions tonight. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was recognize um, the Scarborough High School. Today they hosted a PBE learning walk, and Carrie Lyford and Mary Starr both were able to attend and participate in that. It was completely organized by some of our teacher leaders at the high school, Mary Beth Nolts, Albert McCormick, who we mentioned um, in talking about the aquaponics, Michelle Shoup, who's a Latin teacher and instructional coach, and um, Keith Magnuson, who's a social studies teacher, and Mary Beth teaches ELA. So we had the opportunity to go into each of their classrooms and observe the good work that they're doing around proficiency-based education, and then we had a chance to chat with them and you know, talk about questions that they had um, and answer questions that we had about the work that they're doing. So I want to thank those teachers for continuing to lead mm -hmm. um, and doing really great work at the high school. We also received a note from Chuck Igo, the morning host of Rewind 100.9, um, for the work that we did with the Stuff the Bus project. Mm -hmm. And so he writes to us saying, I hope this note finds you all well and fairly rested after the Thanksgiving break. I wanted to share that the final tally for this year's Stuff the Bus food drive for Preble Street exceeded 114,000 pounds of food. 
This almost filled their entire em um, their empty food facility to the rafters and will help get them through the winter as they continue to meet the needs of those who find themselves in less fortunate circumstances. Um, on behalf of Preble Street, please share my gratitude with your students and your entire school community. Thank you again, Chuck Igo. So that was a really great event. And our students are always doing things like stuff the bus, if you remember what they did with um, uh, Hurricane Harvey and supporting Hamburg School. And right now at Wentworth today, I noticed they're doing a coat drive. Um, so they're collecting coats and things like that. And then the next one, 10 point, oh, I minus 10.2. Um, Elizabeth Lacagnata, if I'm saying her yes, name yes. right, Lacagnata, was um, Maine Telegram's Girls Golfer of the Year. So she helped Scarborough win the Class A Golf State Championship. Um, and my understanding is that this is one of the first times we've had a female golfer, um, and she also won this great honor. So we're really excited for Elizabeth and glad that she's a part of our community. Also, two of our coaches have recently been recognized. So Mike Murphy was named the Maine Telegram's Golf Coach of the Year, and Lance Johnson was named um, the SMAA Football Coach of the Year. So take both of those coaches taking our kids to state championships, and we're excited and honored to have them as part of our team as well. Awesome. There you I'm go. sure there's more, but we'll cap it there for now. <laughs> Okay, and 11.0, new business, 11.1, .1, uh, school board committee assignments. And I have passed all those out to you, but I'll go ahead and read them anyways. Uh, Jody, Carrie, and Leanne will be on our finance committee, and I will be joining that group as needed, or as desired, too. <laughs> I'm sure I'll want to be at a lot of those. Um, myself... Um, Jackie and Mary will be on negotiations, and Jackie will chair the negotiations as usual. Right, Jackie? I'd be honored. Thank you. Okay. And for communications, the chair will be Carrie, along with Jody and Hillary. And the policy committee will be Mary as chair, and Hillary and Leanne. I will also sit in on those just to kind of transfer everything over to the three of you for a while. Facilities will be Mary. Um, legislation, as usual, Jackie will be handling legislation for us up in the state. Um, the vocational schools, as you can see, I've kind of put myself down. I know this is a hard one to fill because of people's commitments in the early morning hours, but. Um, if someone can possibly do the March 15th, you can let me know later who could sit in on that one at PADS in Portland. What time is it? 8.30. They're all 8.30? Yep, they're all 8.30 in the morning, and they go till <coughs> 10. 10.30. 10. 10. Breakfast at 30. Breakfast at 30, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, The Health and Safety Committee will be Jody. The Business and School Partners, Leanne is going to take that on for us. And the IPC School Start Times meeting um, will be an alternate between Carrie and Leanne. And the PEPG, I, I didn't know if you got, I hope you got to see that already, yes. but I had to let you know. I, I hope you can be able to handle that. I think that would be a great committee for you, Hillary. And finally, we can have just uh, begun the pre-K task force, and so Carrie and Hillary have graciously offered to oversee those, that particular committee that will have a lot of work to do in the next couple of years. If there's any problems with these, let me know. If you need me to fill in for you, let me know that any time during the course of the year. I'm happy to pick up wherever you can't fill in. Okay. Those are the committee assignments. You want a copy of that, Mike? And 11.2 is the high school 2019 spring break trip to France. I want to go. I'll let you know right now. <laughs> Would you like to speak about it? 
Yeah, just a, just for a moment, I just want to tell you that I um, organize organizing a trip again for 2019. We do that every two years. So every two years, just about this time of year, you see me. Uh, next year, so we're talking for the French trip. We're always talking about spring break vacation. That's when we leave. Uh, this trip, um, I get the. I was told tonight. Wow, it's a little more expensive than the last time. Uh, we normally we're around every every time we do it. It's thirty five hundred, thirty six hundred, and every year go every two years it goes up a little bit. This year's thirty nine hundred. Mm -hmm. One of the main reason actually there's not that much of an increase. The main reason is rolled into it in the in the price quote. I asked for them to roll into it the insurance which the parents were paying separately, and to roll into in the, um, uh, the trip to Versailles, which parents were paying separately also. So the difference is more uh, about $100, really, because the quote without that was 30, let me see, fancy, hold on, 3600 so that's that's the the, the three hundred dollar difference is right there. It's the insurance that is rather pricey, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Versailles trip. Okay. So um, we will be going this time. We're going to land in Paris. That's where we're going to start, and we're going to end in Milan. We're spending a three days in Italy at the end of the trip. I'm super excited about that because I want the kids to transfer. The both languages are so close together, so especially for those who are my higher level kids, my level four, my AP kids, for them, they're going to be able to actually understand the written part of Italian because of the closeness to the language. Um, so I'm excited about that. I want them to see that. I want them to see that French is like a gateway to other roman mm -hmm. romance. Romance, romance language. How do you pronounce that in English? <laughs> I don't know that word. <laughs> romance, romance. Yeah. <laughs> romance language. I'm excited about that. We will go from Paris, Provence, French Riviera, Monaco, Cinque Terre, and Milan. That's where we're going to leave from. Oh. oh. Yeah. <laughs> I know. When I saw that on the itinerary, I'll bring you back a picture. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to leave on the Friday, uh, the first Friday of the vacation. This is what I asked for. Of course, with those reservations with EF, which is the company that we travel with every time, uh, that's a window. They, they, I'm asking at the latest on that Friday at the earliest, on the Thursday before, so there might be a missing day there. That That's them at the last minute that gives us. But we come back on that Monday or Tuesday, so we will miss a day for sure there on the way back. Um, questions? Um, well, when you're going from Paris to uh, Milan, will you take the train or will you We're going fly? from Paris to Right after Paris, uh, Provence. Okay. So, so from there to Provence, we're in the train, we're in the okay. TGV, in the bullet point, in the bullet train, yeah. Awesome. What grade is this open to? It's open to any <coughs> students that will. So for this year, I'm going to talk to our freshmen and our, all the way up to our juniors, because they're seniors, I'll be gone by then. So by the time they go, we're talking about kids that will be finishing their level two up on up to the AP. So finishing their sophomore year on up to the end of their senior year. Yes, Mary? Oh, and, and how many students are you going to bring? I don't know yet. Oh. So we're going to open registration. I always wait till I come here, and then tomorrow I'm opening registration. We'll see. Uh, I've had trips between, I think my biggest trip was 27, and last year was a smaller trip, and we had, I want to say 16 that I had last year. And the adults going, uh, I'm going with the group, Renee Mianuzzi, the other, fr and one other French teacher is coming. 
Uh, and then it depends on the enrollment. Every time I reach an extra six students, I add an adult. I know that on the waiting list is Brianna Kelman is uh, going to be our third incoming teacher if we have the numbers. So I try to max out the amount of adult per kid. The ratio is actually uh, for every six, seven. So at the most, 11 students per teacher, at most. Because as soon as I reach 12, I can bring the number two person. And as soon as I reach 18, I can bring the third one. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Sounds like a fabulous trip. Um, Every thank years. you for doing that with our Going students and well. making that possible because that's a fabulous trip. I think you may have just thank planned you. my trip next fall. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Eleven point three is the approval of proposed Westbrook Region Vocational Center um, budget. I'm going to have. Mrs. Sizemore, talk about that a bit. And yep. This is the capital budget that uh, the spending schools uh, need, the school boards need to uh, approve. And I, it's in your uh, folder. Uh, Scarborough's assessment, it's based on um, our enrollment. And the capital cost assessment for 1819 is uh, $1,558.02. Um, the capital budget takes care of equipment for um, Westbrook Volk and, um, and the same thing with the grand total down here is $148,324.72. Um, that is um, the capital and, all, and from the previous year. That's our assessment for this is done every two years. So like our assessment for 1819 is based on uh, 1718 and 1617. And so the school boards of each of those different towns there need to approve the uh, capital uh, budget, equipment budget. Is there a motion? Move approval as printed. Second. Any questions? I just have a comment. I just wish that we had more students participating in this program. It looks like enrollment, though, has gone up from spring of last year, April of last year. There were 17 students. Mm -hmm. Now there's 22. Now there's 22. So it's moving in the right direction. Still small. 900 students. I know. Mm. Well, and it's only available to juniors and seniors. Right. Yes, I am aware of that. I'm curious to see if there's going to be a difference with this business school partnership. Is there mm -hmm. going to be a difference in attendance? Mm -hmm. Because we have the internship at the high school now, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It'll allow students to go and right. work in their place. And, and with proficiency-based education, we're really trying to grow our thinking um, inside the school system, as well as the students and the parents thinking around what, you know, what education can look like. And a one-size-fits-all model just isn't going to do it. So. Thank you. Are we ready for a vote? Very good. All in favor of approving the uh, money for the vocational center in Western? And that is seven plus one. Thank you. Thank you. And is it just for the Westbrook? And what about Portland? We do not. we we do not vote no, on no, Portland. Um, okay. Our our school is Westbrook. Okay. Very good. And now we'll move on to uh, 11.4, which is the first reading of policy BEDH. That is the public participation at board meetings. And I'll just give you a little bit of an introduction on this in particular. Um, uh, the policy we had, um, was, it kind of came to my attention uh, about a year or so ago, or le uh, maybe a little bit less than that. Uh, by Drummond and one, one of the lawyers from Drummond and Woodson just mentioning to us that she thought we should probably take a quick peek at that again. And, and so we decided to do that and to also take a look at a couple of other policies um, and one being their recommended sample. Um, and then we kind of looked over what we had here and decided that 
Ours was really quite lengthy, uh, probably unnecessarily lengthy, and um, so we, we decided to reduce it and come up with the policy that you have in front of you tonight. So, um, is there a Move motion? Move approval for a first reading. Second. Very good. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Seven plus one. Thank you. 11.5, first reading of policy JFCK, students' use of cellular telephones and other electronic devices. Um, I believe the only change being made on this particular policy was the cross-reference mm -hmm. at the bottom of the page. Yeah. So there's, there's nothing else to be concerned with other than us cross-referencing it. Are there any questions about that? I mean, I need a motion. Um, move approval for the first reading, policy JFCK. Second. Any questions? Seeing none, Just all the comments, I think yeah. that's a great idea to cross-reference. I think that's it's very helpful. Right. Okay. I think it shows, I think the cross-reference cross shows how technology has really um, become a part of our students' lives. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that there's six other policies that um, are touching base with, with this one just right. shows how things have changed. Mm -hmm. Good point. All in favor? 7.1, I mean 7 plus 1, thank you. And JFCKR, and in this particular case, student use of telephone and other electronic devices as well as a implementation. And simply we kind of dropped some of the devices. For example, nobody's using the MP3 player at school anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we also dropped the term vibrate. And we kind of looked at this policy and brought it up to date. Is there a motion on this policy? Move approval as printed. Second. Any questions? Jackie. Yes. I have uh, just one, and, and I don't know if it's important or not. It would seem to me that it's important. And, and this is a question for the superintendent. How do we handle or should we be handling when a student is maybe awaiting an urgent uh, urgent news concerning a family member? That is, do we have an exception to that? You know, if, if, you know, if somebody was having a baby or the grandfather was having an operation or... Uh, Children get anxious over that, and you know, when I was in school and you were in school, we didn't have cell phones, but that's part of our atmosphere now. Mm -hmm. And we used to call the school, and the school would come and get you and take you to the nurse's office or someplace so you could call home. But I, I don't know if that's an issue, and if it might be an issue, it isn't addressed. So um, there's lo I think there's lots of room for flexibility. Our school leaders are very responsive to student needs, and so long as they're made aware, I'm sure that they, I can guarantee that accommodations would be made. I think one of the challenges with students having devices on them all the time is that sometimes then they're going through something or they're getting communication and we don't necessarily know about it, so it actually makes it more challenging for us to support a student. For example, if they're not feeling well, they might be texting their mom they're not feeling well rather than going to the nurse. And that actual scenario happened this year um, and that's what got me looking closely at this policy and thinking deeply about it along with some of the measures that um, some of our other school districts in the state have, gone have actually created stricter policies banning devices in the middle school grades. Um, and we talked about that and we really got input from all of our administrators about it and we feel like our existing practices are working well. Um, but it's something that we're, we're always monitoring and trying to stay on top of because um, just as I was hearing about districts banning devices, that was the same time Apple released their new watch that now you can, you don't need your phone for your watch to work as a phone where before you would have to have both. So 
it just seems like banning isn't a good policy, but maybe being uh, making sure that we're addressing it through our digital citizenship curriculum and talking about when do you when do you need to rely on supports of the school if you're getting you know urgent messages or you have a family situation that you're dealing with. So that would be that would be my worry, but I trust that our leadership 100% would accommodate any student need. Um, but also encourage our parents and our students to make sure you're communicating with your leadership about those things. So okay. I'm willing to leave it alone mm -hmm. if you think it is being handled appropriately. Mm -hmm. And uh, otherwise, I think that we would have to include something because, as I say, it's the way of the world today, and it's beyond my comprehension, quite frankly, to see, you know, all the time. I had a woman bump into me yesterday walking down the car to the dentist office because she's doing this, you know. So it's not just youngsters who are doing it, it's everybody. Mm -hmm. I will also make sure that I, when I follow up with leadership about this policy that I bring that to their attention. Um, I just wanted to mention that one of the things I was um, really struck by on our PBE learning walk at the high school today, it was the first time I've spent much time in in the high school, um, and the first time I've ever watched classes in the high school. I wanted to stay there all day. I told Julie I'd love to go back to high school and just get to sit there all day without having to be that age again. <laughs> it would be great. Um, but one of the things that really struck me was the seamless integration of technology, which was all new to me because I haven't had kids at that age level. And when I was in high school, obviously that wasn't how it was. And um, for instance, during science class, they were having to take temperatures every two minutes. And they all had their smartphones out with their timer functions, just timing every two minutes and then jotting down temperatures. And I didn't see it, but I guess in one of the other classes um, at one point the teacher said, just pull out your phone and do a little research. Just pull up and see what you can find. And I thought, it's just genius. Instead of fighting against what is second nature to these kids, mm -hmm. make it work for you. And But also, at one point in one of the classes, a kid was on a phone in, in just doing something they probably shouldn't have been doing, distracting themselves from class, and the teacher just really smoothly said, can I see that for a second? And I assume probably took it till the end of class, but it wasn't a big deal. I, so I felt like, based on what I saw over the hour and a half I was at the high school today, I was really impressed with how the technology was being both used and managed. All right, then. Yes. Um, I had a question at the uh, number one where it says, um, Students are prohibited from using privately owned electronic devices, including but not limited to cell phones, smartphones, da da da. Um, at, in study halls, field trips, and co curricular, extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. The extracurricular part was the, how do we manage that? How do we tell someone at a club that they can't use their phone? I just didn't understand how that was possible. So I think it's about setting expectations and like like Carrie and Mary observed today, there are times that they probably will be asked to use them when it's appropriate, but the idea is to not be distracting you from what you're Whatever there for. Whatever you're there for. Okay. Are we all set to vote on this? Okay, all in favor? And it is unanimous plus one. Thank you. 12.0 appointments, 12.1 the high school winter coaches. Is this, is this another one? Is this the third one or is this the second? So um, with the high school winter coaches, I did want to, um, you have them listed here, 12.1. As you can see, there's several winter coaches that are funded through the general fund and um, some are also booster funded and some are volunteers. Um, but you may notice that we have two coaches with the same last name. And so in looking at our nepotism policy, BCC, um, what we have here is a brother-sister um, coaching team for the girls' uh, hockey, varsity hockey team. So Caitlin is the varsity head coach and then um, her brother Jordan was one of uh, three applicants, 
did I say that backwards? Yeah, oh, Lincoln. Lincoln. I'm sorry, Lincoln Jordan. Um, <coughs> was one of three applicants, so I wanted the board to be know to know that we hosted the job. Um, we had three positions. We had three applicants. Lincoln has an expertise in goalkeeping, um, which was something that we needed. I last I knew we didn't have a goalkeeper, and um, we had a student who was a figure skater who was going to test it out. So. Um, he really was the most qualified applicant. Obviously, we knew, we learned of him, or he learned of the position probably through his sister. Um, and in our nepotism policy, it does state that um, exceptions can be made, and the board may approve an exception to the policy, um, except for the statutory prohibition against employment of board members' spouses. If there is a determination that it's in the best interest of the school department and appropriate measures can be taken to avoid conflict, it is the intent of the board um, that the, this provision be narrowly uh, construed and used only in rare circumstances. Um, and so I would argue that this is a rare circumstance as um, he, that he has a very niche skill set that our team needs. So I just wanted to make you aware of that before you voted on it. Is there a motion? Move approval as printed. Second. Any questions, Jackie? No, I just have a comment. I, uh, it appears that there are only four staff people who are coaches. Everybody else is from the outside. <laughs> oh my gosh, how can that be? I also found it. Um, I also found it interesting that the booster, I added up how much was funded from the boosters and almost $9,000 of just the winter coaching staff is um, booster funded. Um, and as you mentioned, some of it was also, there's also volunteers. Any other questions? Are we ready to vote? Mm -hmm. All in favor? One plus one. And 12.2, the high school co-curricula. My recommendation is to approve appointments as presented. Is there a motion? Move approval so as printed. Second. Okay. Very good. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, all in favor? Seven plus one. Thank you. And that brings us to 13.0. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay. Very good. All in favor? Unanimous. Good night, everyone. Thank you.